debt ceiling showdown. The key vote tonight is both parties battle divisions on Capitol Hill with that default threat looming. You, you don't want to miss and be in history on the wrong side of this. Plus, in tonight's Prime Focus, we go behind the lofty promise and look at the real perils of the lottery and meet people struggling with addiction in their quest to strike it rich. Were there times where you chose to buy a lottery ticket instead of putting food on the table? Every time. Every time. I still have to keep playing because it's not enough. It was never enough. And Julia Louis-Dreyfus gets personal talking about her newest comedy, You Hurt My Feelings. Both Michaela and I are in uh, long, happy marriages, and the idea, and we're both creative people, and the idea of our spouse not just withholding, but lying about their, t really lying about their input and their take on what it is we've done, I think would be devastating. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including a suspected serial killer under arrest in Texas who is apparently now telling authorities he may be connected to 10 or more murders. And the dire one-sentence warning about how artificial intelligence could put us all at risk of extinction. And just like that, the news rocking Hollywood tonight, Sex and the City actress Kim Cattrall is returning as Samantha Jones. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin in Washington with that debt ceiling showdown. If you're tuning in right now wondering when all of this will be over, tonight we may finally be inching towards some resolution that would allow lawmakers to avoid what would otherwise be a catastrophic default. The House of Representatives is set to vote on a bipartisan deal to avert the default, but there are members in both parties who remain unhappy tonight with the compromise. Speaker McCarthy has tried to keep his party in line, but dozens of his fellow Republicans have defected. And the Speaker has conceded he'll need the help of Democrats in order to get it passed, but how many will vote for the deal? The head of the influential Congressional Progressive Caucus will vote no, and we are standing by to talk with her. But first, our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, the hard sell. With the clock ticking, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy under pressure to pass the deal he negotiated with the White House and under fire from some of his own Republican members. In the final hours, what are you telling some of your members that are still on the fence? You, you don't want to miss and be in history on the wrong side of this. Don't miss out. Don't, don't sit back and think, I wanted something so much more. Yeah, there's a lot of things I want too, but this is one that moves us in the right direction. Overnight, the Congressional Budget Office determining the bill would reduce the deficit by $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Conservatives unmoved, especially after the CBO also found the bill's stricter work requirements for some Americans on food assistance would actually increase spending by $2 billion. Speaker McCarthy calls it a victory. What do you think? You know, it's not a victory. It's a, it's a surrender. There's anger on the left, too. President Biden and top White House aides reaching out to some 120 Democratic lawmakers, urging them to hold their nose and vote yes. I think things are going as planned, God willing. The White House priority, getting Republicans to agree to raise the debt ceiling and avoid an economic catastrophe. But for some progressives, the trade-off isn't worth it. Voting against this bill is not a vote against the president. It's against the Republican extremism to hijack this country with debt ceiling debates every few years. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. And Rachel, the deadline to raise the debt ceiling is now June 5th, this coming Monday. Bottom line, can this bill pass the House and the Senate in time? Well, Lindsay, the House and the Senate are on track to pass this bill before the nation defaults on June 5th, but leaders know that they have to move very quickly here. Tonight, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer warning there is no room for error. He's hoping to have this bill passed and through the Senate by the end of the weekend, Lindsay. Yeah, slim margin for error here. Rachel Scott from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. For more on tonight's vote, I want to bring in Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you have publicly stated that you were voting no on this debt limit deal. Last night, we had a Republican Congresswoman, uh, Nancy Mace, on the show. She's also a no as well, but for quite very different reasons. So I, I want to ask you the same questions that we asked her. Uh, this bipartisan deal has concessions from both sides. What is missing from this deal that could turn your vote around? 
Well, I think that the key thing here is that this never should have been a hostage taking situation. This was a deal that was negotiated with a gun to the American people's he heads. And the stated reason that Republicans did this is because they said they wanted to cut spending and cut the deficit. That is not what is happening in this deal. They uh, are actually increasing Pentagon spending, which is the only agency, by the way, that has never been audited. And we shame them into increasing spending for veterans. That's a good thing. But they are cutting the money for the IRS to go after wealthy tax cheats. And they are kicking poor people off of SNAP benefits. They are uh, hurting uh, environmental justice efforts across the country. So they got ideological principles in that hurt poor people and working people and forced them to bear the brunt of continuing to give wealthy people tax breaks. I understand your concerns about the work requirements. OMB Director Shalonda Young, however, has defended those requirements, saying that while the bill will phase in a higher age limit from 49 to 54, the bill also includes new exemptions for homeless populations, veterans, and foster care youth, and that the higher age limit sunsets by 2030. How do you respond to that? You know, what's happening is to say a certain number of people are eligible, the same number of people are eligible, is very different than saying who is getting kicked on and how we're going to get some of those new people that are exempted uh, back onto the, the rolls. And so I'll give you an example. The people that we're kicking off are already on food stamps. They are no longer going to get them. The new people that are exempted, and it's a good thing that we got those exemptions in, but that includes, as an example, homeless folks, including homeless veterans. How are we going to go out and find those people and tell them that they are now newly eligible for these SNAP benefits? As you're well aware, the deal is most likely going to get the yes votes that it needs from moderate members of both parties. Would you say that a bipartisan deal is a good thing, by and large, if it avoids a catastrophic default? I absolutely think we cannot default. And it is de Democrats led by President Biden that are being responsible in this situation and ensuring that we are not going to default. I also think it is very important to have a strong no vote on the board to say to the American people that we know that this was wrong, this should never happen again, and we are going to continue to fight for poor people and working people who are going to be hurt by this deal. Let's not, let's not minimize that. There are bad things in this bill that are going to happen because Republicans demanded it and because they held us hostage and they were willing to take us to the brink of financial ruin and catastrophe. Does this strictly come down to party line? Because when we talk to Republicans, they're pointing the finger at the Democrats. When we're talking to Democrats, they're pointing the fingers at, at Republicans. When we hear from average Americans, people in recent weeks who receive Social Security, for example, they say, look, I am responsible for balancing my checkbook at the end of the day, why do we hold our politicians to some kind of different directive? Well, I think this is a real fallacy in how this is all portrayed. And I think this is really important um, for your viewers to understand. What Republicans have done is they took a negotiated budget agreement that goes through a negotiated process. Republicans and Democrats agree. We all vote on it. We pass that through. And then the debt ceiling is essentially to allow Congress to implement that. There is a separate negotiation process for the budget. And what they have done is they have violated their constitutional obligation. It is in the Constitution that we must pay for the things that Congress has passed, appropriated, and spent. That is what we do as a body. And just last question for you, Congresswoman. Bottom line, despite your no vote, do you believe that this deal will pass in both the House and Senate? Yes, I believe it will pass, and it's important that it passes. It's important that we do not default, as Republicans were trying to have us do. But I also think we shouldn't give them more votes than they need. And Speaker McCarthy should produce at least, at least two-thirds of the votes that are needed. He's the Speaker of the House. He negotiated this deal. If he can't hold two-thirds of his conference and he requires more and more Democratic votes, then I don't think he should be the Speaker of his party if he can't even get the votes to pass it. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, we so appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you.
A Texas man who called police to turn himself in for the murder of his roommate is now suspected of being a serial killer. On that call, Raul Mesa confessed to more than one murder, and tonight up to 10 cold cases are now under investigation. ABC's Maria Villarreal has the details. Tonight, suspected serial killer Raul Meza back in jail after police in Texas say he confessed to two murders and admitted he was planning to strike again. I will let you know that Mr. Meza said he was ready and prepared to kill again and he was looking forward to it. 28 returns to a Raul Meza Jr. at that address. Police launching an urgent manhunt for Meza more than a week ago after his roommate, 80-year-old Jesse Fraga, was fatally stabbed in his home north of Austin. And Meza was seen afterward driving Fraga's truck. Investigators say while Meza was on the run, he called detectives detailing how he murdered Fraga and implicating himself in the unsolved murder of a woman strangled to death several years prior. That was found to be the death of Gory Lofton in 2019. On Monday night, U.S. Marshals apprehended Meza at a bus stop. They say he had a bag with zip ties, a flashlight, a gun, and multiple rounds inside. The 62-year-old, already a convicted murderer. In 1982, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison for killing third grader Kendra Page. His release after serving 11 years for good behavior. We don't want him in sparking protests in Austin at the time. We don't know how many more people he killed or would have killed. So here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So it was a travesty of justice uh, totally in this case. Maria Villarreal joins us now. Maria, what are investigators looking into now? Hey, Lindsay, investigators say that these two latest cases may not be where the story ends. In fact, they confirm they are looking at between eight and ten cold cases in this area alone that Meza may be responsible for, and they date back all the way to 1996. Lindsay? Wow. All right. Maria Villarreal, thank you. Tonight, authorities have now turned to drones in order to search that apartment building collapse in Davenport, Iowa. Five people are still unaccounted for. Two are believed to be inside. The rest of the building is teetering, and they say at the risk of collapse. Tonight, what we now know about that building. ABC's Alex Perez is on the scene again in Iowa tonight. Tonight, authorities in Davenport, Iowa, using drones to search for the missing inside that collapsed apartment building. It's an agonizing wait for the family of Ryan Hitchcock and Brandon Colvin, who authorities say are likely somewhere inside. Colvin's son wants a search teams to move faster. I don't feel like it's that hard just go in there and look for these people that's in there. They just need to go in there and look. How do you guys hold on to hope with all this destruction there right now? For me personally, that lady, her being found in there alive, gave me hope. I'm just trying to just stick it out and keep having hope. But officials have not provided a search timeline and say each time crews enter the building, it grows weaker and could collapse at any moment. Residents here say there was a history of plumbing and sewage leaks. We have problems with water damage. When you contact the people who own the building, they don't do anything. Required repair work was underway when the building collapsed, but there are new questions about why engineers hired by the building told city officials it was still safe for residents. Alex Perez joins us now. And Alex, I know you got a chance to speak with the property manager of the building today. What did she have to say? Yeah, Lindsay, that property manager would only tell me that they are praying for the families and working on refunding deposits to the tenants. As for the owner here, he has been fined $300 so far and is due in court June 9th. Lindsay? Alex Perez, our thanks to you. Next, a South Carolina convenience store owner is facing a murder charge for allegedly shooting a 14-year-old boy he accused of shoplifting. The boy was shot in the back as he tried to run away. Police did find a gun near the teen. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. This 14-year-old boy is dead, and tonight this gas station owner is accused of murdering him after police say he suspected the teenager was trying to steal from his store. It looks like he might be a juvenile. Okay, cop it out there. 58-year-old Rick Chow owns this Shell gas station in Columbia, South Carolina that's now covered in graffiti from protesters. On Sunday, investigators say that 14-year-old Cyrus Carmack Belton was at a cooler holding four bottles of water that police say he put right back down when the store owner accused him of stealing. This location has had lots of incidents in the past, shoplifting incidents. He did not shoplift anything. We have no evidence that he stole anything whatsoever. A struggle in the store spilled out into the street, and as the teenager ran away, 
Police say the store owner shot the child in the back. People are outraged near and far. Even the county coroner says she's heartbroken. And I'm going to tell y'all, I, I have a son who is that age. Mm. Police underline that they did find a gun near the boy's body and that it belonged to the teenager. There's a stand-your-ground law in South Carolina, but authorities say it doesn't help the store owner in this case because the teenager was killed as he was running away. Obviously very significant that he was shot in his back. And Steve Osinsami joins us now. You're learning this isn't the first time that the store owner has been in a situation like this? Actually, it's the third. Police say that he shot people in his store twice before. In one incident, uh, police say that no one was hit. They could not find that person who he shot at. In a second incident a few years ago, they say that that one was self-defense, according to police. And then, of course, this one. And, you know, there's one thing, of course, police underline in this incident that, that has to be said, and that is that this this child did have a gun, but police say that at no point did it appear that he pointed the gun at the shopkeeper or his son. Lindsay. All right, interesting to note that. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. A Los Angeles jury has found the That 70s Show actor Danny Masterson guilty on two counts of forcible rape in a second trial. The first ended in a mistrial in November of 2022. The actor pleaded not guilty in both. Like Masterson, all three women were members of the Church of Scientology. The alleged attacks happened between 2001 and 2003, but the women said that church teachings against reporting to police made them hesitant to come forward. Masterson faces 30 years to life in prison. Next to the war in Ukraine after that drone attack on a residential area in Moscow. Ukraine launching attacks now inside Russia. A Russian refinery set ablaze. And new images from Kiev of missile debris raining down on a busy roadway. Here's ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reporting from Ukraine tonight. Tonight, dramatic dash cam video. Missile debris crashing into a crowded highway in the Ukrainian capital. The missile shot down part of a wave of recent Russian attacks. But Ukraine now taking the fight inside Russia. Explosive drones striking two oil refineries deep inside Russian territory, setting one of them on fire in video circulating online. Russian regions bordering Ukraine also under attack. The aftermath seen in videos circulating online. A Russian official saying one person killed and two seriously injured by Ukrainian artillery. These latest attacks coming after a swarm of explosive drones hit Moscow. A Ukrainian official suggesting Ukraine was responsible. And our Mary Bruce asking the White House to clarify its position on not condoning attacks inside Russia. Does Ukraine, you know, a country that's been under attack for more than a year, not have a legitimate right to, to attack its aggressor back on its own territory? We don't tell them where to strike. We don't tell them, uh, you know, we're not to strike. And tonight, the U.S. announcing more Avenger air defense systems for Ukraine. Our team shown one already in action. The Avenger is a highly mobile air defense system. This unit's job is to hunt down a Russian drone or missile, and then the heat-seeking technology on board does the rest. The Avenger firing Stinger missiles. Ukraine getting more of those, too. Tom Sufi Burridge joins us now from Ukraine. Hey, Tom, what is the White House saying about this new funding? Yeah, Lindsay, the new package is worth $300 million. It includes more air defense missiles, more ammunition for artillery. It takes total U.S. military aid to Ukraine to more than $38 billion. The White House reiterating tonight U.S. weaponry should not be used for attacks inside Russia. Lindsay? Tom Sufi Burridge for us from Ukraine tonight. Thanks so much, Tom. Amazon has agreed to pay $25 million over child privacy violations linked to its Alexa devices. The FTC has accused the company of using its popular devices to collect voice data from children under the age of 13. The DOJ says Amazon has kept the information, quote, indefinitely, despite parents asking for the data to be deleted. Amazon disagrees with the claims, but says it will remove child profiles that have been inactive for more than 18 months. Next tonight, we are 524 days until the 2024 presidential election, but the campaign for who will be the Republican nominee is in full swing tonight in Iowa. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is on the attack tonight against former President Trump. Our chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl reports in tonight from Iowa. This country is going in the wrong direction. We all know it. We feel it. Ron DeSantis took his hard-edged culture war message across Iowa today, slamming Joe Biden and the, quote, cultural elites, but also making a clear contrast between himself and Donald Trump. 
leadership is not about entertainment. It's not about virtue signaling. It's not about kind of the show. Uh, what the essence of leadership is, is about producing results. DeSantis hit the issues that have made him both divisive and a popular figure among conservatives. His opposition to masks and vaccine mandates during the COVID pandemic and his ban on classroom discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity. She's a force. He also made a point to feature his wife and top political advisor, Casey DeSantis. Ron DeSantis always stands up for what's right. He never backs down. He says what he's going to do and he gets it done. Trump has been relentlessly attacking DeSantis for months. Now the Florida governor is hitting back. He used to say how great Florida was. Hell, his whole family moved to Florida under my governorship. Are you kidding me? He suggested Trump just can't win a general election. Because I think our voters are looking at this and they say, you know, yeah, we appreciate what he did, but we also recognize there are a lot of voters just aren't going to ever vote for him. We just have to accept that. How's it going? Iowa Republicans who came to see DeSantis told us they're not ready to say they support him, but over and over again, they told us they want an alternative to Trump. We all agree that he did good things, kept the country moving, but... His character is not good. I, yeah. I need leadership and someone I can trust and admire. Do you think Trump can be beaten? I hope so. Why do you, why do you hope so? too much garbage on it. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Iowa. John, what are the latest names to join the Republican field? Well, Lindsay, we've learned that former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will announce that he is running for president next Tuesday at an event in New Hampshire. And we've also learned that Mike Pence is going to be announcing that he is running, not exactly a surprise, but now we know that it is in fact happening and it will be next Wednesday, we are told, that he will make his announcement. So the field of Republican presidential candidates is getting bigger. Yeah, only continues to grow there. All right, Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Still much more to get to here on Prime coming up. The rescue mission to save a Navy pilot who ejected from his plane off the Florida coast. A conversation with the employee who says that he was fired from a Christian university for putting his pronouns in his email signature, how the school is responding. But next in our Prime Focus, it's an industry that brings in billions of dollars a year talking about the lottery. While it's a fun pastime for some, it becomes a life-consuming addiction for others. When I buy a lottery ticket, it feels like the best thing in the world, but at the end, of, it feels like the end of the world at the same time. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back, everyone. Playing the lottery is big business in this country, bringing in billions of dollars to state and local governments as millions of Americans put down a few dollars with the hopes of striking it rich. But while dreaming big of lotto winnings is mostly fun and games, for some, it can become an obsession. So in tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Rena Roy looks at the problem of lottery addiction. When I buy a lottery ticket, it feels like the best thing in the world, but at the end, of, it feels like the end of the world at the same time. It's a momentary high that Tavania Thomas says she desperately chased for years. It feels like your heart's gonna explode, but you love it. You don't know what's gonna be behind that glitter that's underneath that ticket. The slim chance of a win on scratch-off tickets and lotto drawings had her going back for more, spending hours every day in convenience stores across Richmond, Virginia, even skipping meals for extra cash. Were there times where you chose to buy a lottery ticket instead of putting food on the table? Every time. Every time. If I woke up in the morning, as soon as my eyes pop up, um, I look at my bank account, and if I had any kind of money, I'm off to a casino, I'm off to a convenience store. I still have to keep playing because it's not enough. It was never enough. While the public's attention is mostly focused on Powerball and Mega Millions drawings, more than two-thirds of state lottery sales come from instant scratch-off tickets with repeat players like Tavania driving sales. A nationwide investigation of state lotteries by the University of Maryland in 2022 found stores that sell tickets are disproportionately clustered in lower income communities in nearly every state where the game is played. It's low income people who are losing a disproportionate amount of their wealth to this to this you know government scheme. Looking back at the history of the lottery, it's always been an attempted means to riches for many Americans. Now that I've earned that money, I'm going to go into business. Amongst black Americans, it also became a chance to gain upward mobility in a system that critics argue had few opportunities for people of color. But lotteries have transformed into a way for states to fill in budgetary gaps for government services without raising taxes. And researchers say low-income taxpayers end up shouldering the burden. State lotteries are exhibit A when it comes to predatory gambling. No one's going to say there's an overtly racist program, but this is definitely a form of systemic racism that has occurred. They have shifted the tax burden away from middle-class taxpayers from property and put it more and more on the backs of low-income people disproportionately, you know, who are black and brown folks across our country. There are studies that show that the lottery system actually is more prevalent and potentially targets communities of color and lower income communities. Exactly. What do you think about that? I think it's a travesty, actually. I am a part of that community. I am a woman of color. I, I'm low income. After experiencing suicidal thoughts, Tavania was able to secure a scholarship to an addiction recovery program at Williamsville Wellness in Virginia. On the first day, it was like a breath of fresh air. I was saved from myself. I didn't have the opportunity to gamble. I didn't have the means to gamble. As a person gambles and begins to lose, they start to chase money. They're trying to find a way out, and it just gets them further and further in the hole. Experts say lottery ticket sales are skyrocketing with increasing jackpots luring in more players. Ticket sales have jumped from $47 billion to $82 billion since 2005, with all but five states operating some form of lottery. The Tax Foundation says approximately 60% of state lottery earnings go directly to the winners, with states keeping the remaining amount to pay for advertisements and government programs like education, health services, and public spaces. In Virginia, where Tavania lives, some $774 million from lottery ticket sales are earmarked for K-12 public education. But in 2022, Virginia received a D grade for how it allocates money to high poverty districts. Leaving questions about where the money is distributed and if some should be going to battling addiction. The Virginia Lottery telling ABC News that it has a proven track record of working to raise awareness of problem gambling and gambling addiction going far beyond what it's required by law to do. While Virginia law requires all lottery profits to go to K-12 through education, the lottery has been repeatedly recognized as a leader in the industry when it comes to using its resources and high public profile to raise awareness and encourage responsible play. Fortunately, 
Most of the bills that have been passed um, over the years do include some help for people that get addicted to gambling, but it's probably still not enough. And I think more of the profits need to go towards helping people that develop gambling disorder. Tavania says her losses are incalculable. These days, she journals and stays in touch with her sponsor to try and keep her mind off gambling. But she says it's a constant battle against temptation. There's gambling everywhere, and that's it, it is tempting. So you think perhaps some of the money should be going to actually help lotto addiction? I think most of the money does need to go to that. And what is your message to others who might be going through something similar? There's help, but you gotta want it. Yes, first, you do have to want the help. Our thanks to Rena Roy for that. If you need help with a gambling problem, reach out to 1-800-GAMBLER. And if you're having thoughts of suicide or experiencing another mental health crisis, call or text 988. And remember, you are not alone. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a grim warning about the future of artificial intelligence. Why experts say it could pose a societal risk of extinction. Actresses Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Michaela Watkins talk about their new film, You've Hurt My Feet feelings and what it was like to work together again. Riding a bike, the chemistry, picking up that Kind of. Yeah. I, I hate to say it. It's yeah, like, it's true. I know we're supposed to act like what we do is really hard sometimes, but this is so easy. <laughs> <laughs> But next, if you feel like more baseball players are hitting home runs, you may be right. We take a look at the possible environmental factors behind it by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about her, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? 
I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Over the Memorial Day weekend, the New York Mets' Pete Alonso became the first player to hit 20 home runs this season, keeping him on track with Aaron Judge's 2022 record pace. But you may be surprised to learn that all those home runs in recent years may actually be impacted by an unlikely factor, climate change. So let's take a look at the long ball and climate change by the numbers. Dartmouth College scientists analyzed more than 100,000 major league games in recent years, along with weather conditions, stadiums, and other factors. And they report that higher temperatures are responsible for an extra 50 or so home runs a year. That's more than 500 climate-assisted homers since 2010. Keep in mind, there have been more than 63,000 home runs in that time. The study found a 1% increase in home run likelihood with every degree that the air warms. It's simple physics, they say. As the air heats up and becomes less dense, baseballs go further. Add to that calculation that the average summer temperature in the U.S. has increased by more than two degrees in the past 40 years, according to NOAA. The scientists ran the numbers and found that based on current carbon pollution trends, there would be an additional 155 warming-aided home runs by 2050 and around 255 extra dingers by the end of the century. And while the impact varies by ballparks and their locations, the researchers said baseball, with all its statistics and analytics, provided an ideal database to observe the effects of climate change. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight, a scare for pedestrians under the watchful eye of falcons, why they're swooping down and putting commuters on guard. And a major life development for actor Al Pacino, the news he's celebrating at 83 years old. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody say I love you. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it.
just over six weeks ago. The man decided to fire shots into your car. You were shot three times. A high school cheerleader shot in a parking lot. Now, in her first interview. And have you ever thought, I'm lucky to be here? Friday on Good Morning America. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A dire warning about the future of artificial intelligence, the rescue of a Navy pilot who ejected from a plane, and the 83-year-old actor expecting a child. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. Artificial intelligence is gaining traction and popularity, but at the same time, the speed of its development is concerning the likes of more than 350 executives, researchers, and engineers. From top AI companies, the concerns stem from AI being potentially used to build chemical weapons, generate disinformation, and people becoming too dependent on it. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Director Jen Easterly urging those more than 350 AI business leaders and innovators to self-regulate and work with the government. But critics say that AI is too underdeveloped to pose a threat. A court has sentenced a limousine company operator to 5 to 15 years in prison for a deadly crash in upstate New York outside Albany. Now Min Hussein found guilty on 20 counts of manslaughter. That crash killed 17 passengers, the driver and two pedestrians. When the 31-foot stretch limo's brakes failed back in 2018, police found the limo had a long history of safety violations and the driver did not have a license to operate a limousine that size. The Department of Transportation announcing a new rule for vehicles requiring them to have an advanced automatic braking system, or AEB, that could prevent roadway injuries and fatalities. The AEB is already installed in the majority of new vehicles, but officials say the new rules will make them more widespread. A Key West Naval Air Station fighter pilot was ejected from an F-5N aircraft approximately 25 miles from the Boca Chica field early this morning. Helicopter search and rescue crew found the pilot who was being flown to a Miami area hospital. That pilot, part of a Navy Reserve squadron composed of training and administration of the reserve and selected reserve personnel. It's not the first time this has happened. Back in 2018, two Navy aviators on a training flight died after their jet crashed near the Key West Naval Air Station. The Navy has not released other details about the jet accident today. Two peregrine falcons are watching over their nest on a seventh floor window ledge in Chicago, but pedestrians must beware as they are protecting their babies. The building is warning people with a sign about these protective parents after a commuter was recently injured. The field museum experts are telling people to just give the falcons some space to raise their chicks. They said once the chicks are a little older this summer, mom and dad will relax. Al Pacino's girlfriend, Noor Al Fala, is eight months pregnant with the veteran actor's fourth child. Pacino has already fathered children with two other women. He's also a father to two 22-year-old twins, Olivia and Anton James Pacino. Al Pacino has never been married. As the debate grows over how gender identity is handled in schools, many employees at educational institutions have said that they feel caught in the middle, and some also say that they've been disciplined because of it, including our next guest. Shua Wilmot was a residence hall director at Houghton University, which is a Christian university in upstate New York, affiliated with Wesleyan Church, a Methodist denomination. Shua, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I appreciate you having me. A university spokesperson released a statement saying personnel matters are confidential, but that Houghton has never terminated employment based on use of pronouns and signatures, and over the years have required anything additional in signatures, including scriptures removed. Were you aware of any such policies about signatures? Yeah, that's a new policy, though. I, I mean, I, the phrase over the years kind of surprises me because that policy was announced in September and sort of passed in October. This is after I had signed my contract for the year. 
Uh, and it was also never added to the employee handbook up until, you know, maybe to this day, but at least until the time that I was told my contract wouldn't be renewed. It was still not in the employee handbook, but it was communicated as a policy this academic year, yeah. I'm curious, did they give you a chance to get rid of that in your signature line, the pronouns in your signature line, before terminating you? Or how did that process play out? Yes, so my supervisor was asked to address it with me uh, and with Reagan. And so we were, we were asked to comply with this policy and we declined. And then I had I personally had to meet with the dean of my department to have a similar conversation. Uh, Reagan was never asked to have a conversation like that because she had already resigned effective at the end of the academic year. But I had intended to continue working at Houghton. And so I had this conversation with the dean. And the long and short of it is eventually I, I said, I don't want to resign and I don't want to comply with this policy. I gave him my reasons why, and he said, I will. I will take this news to the president and HR. And then after that, next thing I know, I'm told that my contract won't be renewed. Uh, it was never explicitly said to me that that could be an end result until it was. If you knew that you could just remove the pronoun from your signature line and could keep your job, would you have done that? I think probably not. I, there was, after a hard conversation with, with my dean, there were a few days that I did take my pronouns out of my email signature thinking, okay, maybe I can concede this one small thing. But I just didn't have peace with it throughout that weekend that I had my pronouns removed. I didn't have peace with it because I don't want to actively play a role in making the community any less inclusive. You've said that you believe that another reason for your firing includes a, a letter that you wrote to church officials about problems that you had with Wesleyan Church's views on gender identity and expression. Uh, you say the entire viewpoint makes unsupported claims to justify trans exclusion. What points do you take exception to? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, well, I would say most of, so most of my letter to the board of the Wesleyan Church was really making helpful suggestions to improve their view of, of gender and identity, uh, to improve their statement on the Wesleyan view of gender expression and identity. And some of those suggestions include that they, the view, the Wesleyan view claims that transgender and transsexual are synonyms, which they're not, and they long have not been. They also use the phrase birth designated gender, which I recommend that they change to sex assigned at birth because doctors assign sex, which is anatomical, physiological, genetic, and physical attributes. Doctors don't assign gender. Uh, but there, there are other things to it as well. I, I think that their theology on it should be re-examined, but I explicitly state in the letter that I am not asking them to change their convictions I, I just want them to have accurate information and to consider making improvements to the statement. Do you believe that your termination infringes on your First Amendment rights? Yeah, I, I would say in a way it does, but the Houghton University is a private institution, so free speech is not protected in the same ways that it is at public institutions. Uh, I know this because I studied higher ed law in 2017. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's not my complaint here. I just want to follow up on that because other faith-based organizations have argued for their own First Amendment, right, saying religious freedom protections allow them to create policies to treat LGBTQ and transgender people differently. What's your response to that argument? Yeah, I think that they have that right. I, I don't think that it's a good practice. I, don't th I, I think that there are plenty of ways in which Christian institutions will and do marginalize people in ways that are antithetical to the way that Jesus would have wanted them to be treated and still wants them to be treated. Uh, and, and that's a shame, but I think that they should have that right to make different sorts of policies. Shua Wilmot, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.
And just like that, Kim Cattrall will reprise her iconic role as Samantha Jones in the season two finale of Max's revival of the HBO series Sex in the City. Cattrall received a mix of backlash and praise for not returning to Max's series and just like that, alongside the rest of the Sex in the City cast. Variety reported that her character will appear in only one scene and it was shot, her, they shot her dialogue on March 22nd in New York City without seeing or speaking to the stars of the series, including the front runner of the series, Sarah Jessica. Parker. Well, you know the old saying, honesty is the best policy, but what if the truth hurts? A24's newest film, You Hurt My Feelings, takes us into a happy marriage with an unhappy hiccup. A writer, played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus, finds out what her husband really thinks of her latest work, and it's not pretty. She confides in her sister, which is played by Michaela Watkins, about what she feels is a huge betrayal. Our Trevor Alt sat down with both actresses to talk about giving us relatable look inside relationships. Oh, he's been lying to me this whole time. I wasn't lying. I was encouraging. That's not true. You were lying to be encouraging. You know what? As an actor, Mark isn't always great. So the times when you don't think he's good, what do you say to him? You were so fantastic. Really? This movie, You Hurt My Feelings, maybe more than any film I've had before an interview, when I just tell a person the plot, they're more likely to go, oh. Like, it's something Good. that cuts right to them. Good. I would imagine this is something that, when you both read the script, you're like, oh, this is really interesting. Without a doubt. In fact, uh, when Nicole Hall of Center, who's the writer and the director of this film, first told me about it, she hadn't written it yet, she just told me the concept. And as soon as she told me the concept, I was like, great, when are we rolling camera? Mm -hmm. I'm doing this movie. Yeah, so, yes. the, so the plot of it is that you're a writer, working on your book, your husband's very supportive, but then you learn that secretly he actually doesn't like it. He doesn't like the book at all. Yes, and I believe you've referred to that as worse than infidelity, as a level of betrayal. Yes, <laughs> I have referred to it as such. Yeah, I think I'm gonna throw up. Right, 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 right there. It's like, it's like, oh God, right here? Oh God. Uh, no, I don't think I can, I can't. He loves you more than life itself. What does that have to do with anything I'm here? It's a very serious yeah. betrayal, and it's a very serious betrayal to my character of Beth. Mm -hmm. Yes. But something that you could relate to. Totally. As a yes, of course, because um, uh, both Michaela and I are in uh, long, happy marriages, and the idea, and we're both creative people, and the idea of our spouse not just withholding, but lying about their, t really lying about their input and their take on what it is we've done, I think would be devastating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for Brad and for Fred, you trust that they're both honest? Oh, um, well, it's funny you say that because when I read the script, I called Nicole Hobson right away and I said, I just absolutely love this script. And she said, you do? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, but now I think Fred is lying to me. And she goes, oh yeah, of course he is. I think you're lying to me right now. And I'm like, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not. And then I just got off the phone and I was like, do you lie to me? Do you lie? <laughs> every time he reads it, every single time he tells me how much he loves it. Every single time! Because he just doesn't like, you know, get it. The two of you play sisters? Yes. Beth and yes. Sarah. You've obviously worked together before. Yes. Uh, riding a bike, the chemistry, picking up that Kinda. Up? Yeah. I, I hate to say it. It's yeah, like, it's true. I know we're supposed to act like what we do is really hard sometimes, but this is so easy. Yeah. <laughs> What you do is, is kind of meaningful. To who? No one. Mikhail and I now have known each other for, for a number of years. We've worked together on, on various projects. And, uh, and we both have many sisters in our families. Mm. And so we understand in our bones the sister dynamic. Mm. And uh, so we could bring that to bear. And it was just, um, I don't know. It was just a gas. It's yeah. like, it's even fun sitting here just to do it. It sounds like you did some improv on the set. Cause the and also, it's a little bit believable. Part of it is credit to the writing, because it's a fantastic no script. 100%. But the characters do feel very lived in. Yes. And the dynamic uh, feels very fluid. You know, we came to set with a script that was like delish and spot on A+. Um, fortunately, uh, 
um, Nicole Hall of Center is a great collaborator, so she's always open to anybody uh, embellishing, enhancing, adding to. And sometimes she's like, okay, more of that. Or she'll say, don't say that. And I'll say, that's in the script. And she'll go, oh, well, that's still okay. <laughs> and, But, <laughs> but it, it is, I, I mean, I, obviously Julia speaks Nicole, Nicole speaks Julia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy to be added into that fray. You don't get a lot of movies, I feel like, that are about relationships with couples that have been together for decades that yeah. have adult children. Right. Was that also part of what was drawing you to it? Also, is a different kind of story to tell. Completely. It's it's a, um, it's so authentic and honest, and it's not about an old married couple arguing at a cocktail party. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not, it's it's so much more than that, and um, and uh, and it's refreshing. I I just don't think. It's not derivative of anything. No, they're a happy couple. Like, th this mm -hmm. is a betrayal, not because there's a problem in the marriage. Right. The reason it's a betrayal is because it's a good marriage. Right. Well, you get Botox. Well, I just get a little bit right here. You know, I can still move my eyebrows. Watch, watch. Oh, yeah. It's so expressive. <laughs> you both have improv backgrounds. You both have the SNL ties. Mm -hmm. Are the two of you just doing bits back and forth in between takes? Julia can like slip into character really fast, but will will keep you laughing until she says, you know, when Nicole says action, she's like into her character, which is amazing, and that's that's my favorite way to that's my favorite way to work because it's just fun no matter what. It's yeah. fun between shots. And we're it's we're funny. looking for the fun. Yeah. Yeah. The movie is funny. This is an A24 film. Yeah. A24 is serious cinema. Mm -hmm. You know, this is critically acclaimed stuff yeah. that we're talking yeah, about. Let's get Do you consider it all when you're doing the, the the balance of comedy and drama? Is there just truth in all of it? Yeah. Or is it just that you do the scene as honest as possible and Absolutely. sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's serious? Totally. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think the reason the comedy works is because it's so real. Yeah. Like it's kind of cringy because it's so real. Yeah. There's not a false note, I don't think. I mean, that's why it is funny. And uh and why it's dramatic. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of dramatic moments in the film, oh, and I gosh, think, yeah. uh, and uh, n n the, the movie straddles both genres, I think, uh, effectively. I love you. Oh, okay, well, uh, never mind. Uh, just generally speaking, what else the two of you got going on? Uh, I have something going on please. that I'm quite passionate about, if you don't mind. Um, I am very moved by uh, the women of Denver who have come together and said, you know what? Uh, I am not into the proliferation of guns in our country. I've had it. This is women on both sides of the aisle. This is gun owners who are saying, now that guns are the number one killer of teenagers and children, I can't support them enough. Our thanks to Trevor for that conversation. You Hurt My Feelings is now in theaters. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Our body camera video captures a terrifying moment. A car on the highway drove up the ramp of a tow truck. You see it there flying into the air. And she's one of the two surviving members of TLC. Rosanda Chili Thomas talks about the new revelations in an upcoming documentary on the R&B group. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live.
The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. Wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including a suspected serial killer under arrest in Texas who is apparently now telling authorities he may be connected to 10 or more murders. Plus, the air quality concerns in the Northeast tonight is smoke from Canadian wildfires has filled the skies over major cities. And do not try this at home if you come face to face with a bison. The warning tonight from authorities to stay away from wildlife. But we do begin tonight in Washington with that debt ceiling showdown. If you happen to be tuning in right now wondering when all of this will be over, tonight we may finally be inching towards some resolution that would allow lawmakers to avoid what would otherwise be a catastrophic default. The House of Representatives is set to vote on a bipartisan deal to avert the default, but there are members in both parties who remain unhappy tonight with the compromise. Speaker McCarthy has tried to keep his party in line, but dozens of his fellow Republicans have defected, and the Speaker has conceded he'll need the help of Democrats in order to get it passed, but how many will vote for the deal? Our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, leads us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, the hard sell. With the clock ticking, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy under pressure to pass the deal he negotiated with the White House and under fire from some of his own Republican members. In the final hours, what are you telling some of your members that are still on the fence? You don't want to miss and be in history on the wrong side of this. Don't miss out. Don't sit back and think, I wanted something so much more. Yeah, there's a lot of things I want too, but this is one that moves us in the right direction. Overnight, the Congressional Budget Office determining the bill would reduce the deficit by $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Conservatives unmoved, especially after the CBO also found the bill's stricter work requirements for some Americans on food assistance would actually increase spending by $2 billion. Speaker McCarthy calls it a victory. What do you think? You know, it's not a victory. It's a, it's a surrender. There's anger on the left, too. President Biden and top White House aides reaching out to some 120 Democratic lawmakers, urging them to hold their nose and vote yes. I think things are going as planned, God willing. The White House priority, getting Republicans to agree to raise the debt ceiling and avoid an economic catastrophe. But for some progressives, the trade-off isn't worth it. Voting against this bill is not a vote against the president. It's against the Republican extremism to hijack this country with debt ceiling debates every few years. Our thanks to Rachel for that. A Texas man who called police to turn himself in for the murder of his roommate is now suspected of being a serial killer. On that call, Raul Meza confessed to more than one murder. And tonight, up to 10 cold cases are now under investigation. ABC's Maria Villarreal has the details. 
Tonight, suspected serial killer Raul Meza back in jail after police in Texas say he confessed to two murders and admitted he was planning to strike again. I will let you know that Mr. Meza said he was ready and prepared to kill again and he was looking forward to it. 28 returns to a Raul Meza Jr. at that address. Police launching an urgent manhunt for Meza more than a week ago after his roommate, 80-year-old Jesse Fraga, was fatally stabbed in his home north of Austin. And Meza was seen afterward driving Fraga's truck. Investigators say while Meza was on the run, he called detectives detailing how he murdered Fraga and implicating himself in the unsolved murder of a woman strangled to death several years prior. That was found to be the death of Gloria Lofton in 2019. On Monday night, U.S. Marshals apprehended Meza at a bus stop. They say he had a bag with zip ties, a flashlight, a gun, and multiple rounds inside. The 62-year-old, already a convicted murderer. In 1982, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison for killing third grader Kendra Page. His release after serving 11 years for good behavior. We don't want him in sparking protests in Austin at the time. We don't know how many more people he killed or would have killed. So here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So it was a travesty of justice uh, totally in this case. Our thanks to Maria for that. Tonight, authorities have now turned to drones to search that apartment building collapse in Davenport, Iowa, where five people are still unaccounted for. Two are believed to be inside. Tonight, what we now know about that building, ABC's Alex Perez is on the scene once again for us in Iowa tonight. Tonight, authorities in Davenport, Iowa, using drones to search for the missing inside that collapsed apartment building. It's an agonizing wait for the family of Ryan Hitchcock and Brandon Colvin, who authorities say are likely somewhere inside. Colvin's son wants a search teams to move faster. I don't feel like it's that hard just go in there and look for these people that's in there. They just need to go in there and look. How do you guys hold on to hope with all this destruction there right now? For me personally, that lady, her being found in there alive, gave me hope. I'm just trying to just stick it out and keep having hope. But officials have not provided a search timeline and say each time crews enter the building, it grows weaker and could collapse at any moment. Residents here say there was a history of plumbing and sewage leaks. We have problems with water damage. When you contact the people who own the building, they don't do anything. Required repair work was underway when the building collapsed, but there are new questions about why engineers hired by the building told city officials it was still safe for residents. Our thanks to Alex Perez. Now to the air quality alert for much of the Northeast as smoke from wildfires in Nova Scotia, Canada makes its way across the east. Haze has surrounded the Philadelphia skyline. The National Weather Service declared a code orange alert there. Record heat is not helping matters in Friday is expected to be a scorcher. Let's get right to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano who's tracking it all for us. Hey Rob. Hey, Lindsay, yeah, this code orange, uh, it, it, it means that it doesn't just smell like wildfire or campfire. It's unhealthy for sensitive groups, and that's what we've seen with this. Here are the states that still have those alerts up. Connecticut, all of New Jersey, eastern parts of Pennsylvania, including Philadelphia, which you saw, and then Delaware, that alerts up at least until tomorrow. So the same high pressure that brought a beautiful week into the northeast, uh, kind of driving that fire and, and swirling the, the smoke around that easterly flow through New York and Philly. You see that red, that's our computer model, showing it becoming a little bit more diffuse tomorrow so we're, we're hoping that things get encouraging and then a cold front comes through over the weekend and really uh, blows it out we're watching this other disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the, the National Hurricane Center has put out a 20% chance of it developing into something tropical. Regardless, it's going to be spinning there for a couple of days. So flood watch is posted, Palm Beach down through South Florida. And we're going to have rounds of heavy rain here, especially for the sun, southern part of the peninsula. There you swirl, see the swirl. Could see up to three to six inches of rainfall with this uh, development into a tropical storm. It is possible. Tomorrow, as you know, Lindsay, is the first day officially of hurricane season. We know you'll be watching it for us. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now to a terrifying crash caught on camera. Police body cam captures the moment a car driving on the highway goes up the ramp of a tow truck and then flies into the air at full speed. The driver was seriously injured. ABC's Janae Norman has more. A police body camera capturing the wild moment a car traveling down a highway in Georgia launches off the back of a tow truck at full speed. 
Yeah, they're like 10, 50, 10, 50 rollovers. Watch again as the car takes off using the back of the tow truck as a de facto runway, then flies 120 feet in the air before crashing to the ground, smashing into another vehicle. Deputies in Loundis County, Georgia, were already on location responding to another arrest following a traffic stop along Highway 34. That is definitely not something we see every day as Georgia State Troopers. Officials confirm a 21-year-old woman from Tallahassee was behind the wheel of the car. She survived with serious injuries and is still recovering in the hospital in stable condition. The crash is still under investigation, but all we're worried about is that she heals and uh, that she gets better. A deputy was hit by flying debris and suffered minor injuries and was released from the hospital the same day. Officials are reminding people to remain attentive when traveling at high speeds. Move over, slow down, be careful, try to get rid of all the distractions, anything that might keep you from getting home safely because in the end, that's what we're all aiming for is for everyone to make it to their, their destination safely. Just unbelievable video there, thanks to Janae. Next tonight, we are 524 days until the 2024 presidential election, but the campaign for who will be the Republican nominee is now in full swing in Iowa. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is on the attack tonight against former President Trump. Our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, reports in tonight from Iowa. This country is going in the wrong direction. We all know it, we feel it. Ron DeSantis took his hard-edged culture war message across Iowa today, slamming Joe Biden and the, quote, cultural elites, but also making a clear contrast between himself and Donald Trump. Leadership is not about entertainment. It's not about virtue signaling. It's not about kind of the show. Uh, what the essence of leadership is, is about producing results. DeSantis hit the issues that have made him both divisive and a popular figure among conservatives. His opposition to masks and vaccine mandates during the COVID pandemic and his ban on classroom discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity. She's a force. He also made a point to feature his She's wife and top political advisor, Casey DeSantis. Ron DeSantis always stands up for what's right. He never backs down. He says what he's going to do and he gets it done. Trump has been relentlessly attacking DeSantis for months. Now the Florida governor is hitting back. He used to say how great Florida was. Hell, his whole family moved to Florida under my governorship. Are you kidding me? He suggested Trump just can't win a general election. Because I think our voters are looking at this and they say, you know, yeah, we appreciate what he did, but we also recognize there are a lot of voters just aren't going to ever vote for him. We just have to accept that. How's it going? Iowa Republicans who came to see DeSantis told us they're not ready to say they support him, but over and over again, they told us they want an alternative to Trump. We all agree that he did good things, kept the country moving, but... His character is not good. I, yeah. I need leadership and someone I can trust and admire. Do you think Trump can be beaten? I hope so. Why do you, why do you hope so? too much garbage on it. Our thanks to John for that. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. They're one of the most successful groups of all time, lasting through triumphs and tragedy. Rosanda Chili Thomas tells us why she chose to be a part of a documentary chronicling their journey. For me, I kind of hate to go there, but I know it's important, you know, and um, cause you never know how your story can help people. I mean, just the fact that people come up to us and tell us about our songs. Next, residents warned to take shelter. The country whose attempt at launching a spy satellite ended with an explosion. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In Iran, the two journalists who first reported on the death of Masa Amini, the young Iranian woman who was killed while in custody of Iran's morality police, stood trial in an Iranian court today. The two have been in prison for eight months and are charged with conspiracy and rebellion against national security, which carries a possible death sentence. And a North Korean rocket meant to send the country's first spy satellite into space failed, exploding in its first stage of flight. Residents in Japan and South Korea were told to take shelter during the launch. The South Korean military quickly conducted an operation to recover parts of North Korea's launch vehicle. U.S. officials are calling this a huge embarrassment for the North Koreans. In India, a gruesome story is making global headlines, and we warn you, the images are graphic. A 16-year-old girl was murdered in a public alleyway while several bystanders walked by. Authorities say the suspect was in a relationship with a young woman and repeatedly stabbed her as people there failed to help. There were reportedly no attempts to call police. Authorities have arrested the man accused of her murder. She's a core member of one of the most influential groups in the history of music. Rosanna Chili Thomas, one third of TLC, took the industry by storm, changing the way that people saw female artists. But the women were met with controversy and tragedy, including the death of member Lisa Left Eye Lopez back in 2002. Our Phil Lipoff had the chance to sit down one on one with Chili ahead of a new documentary, TLC Forever, airing on Lifetime, which chronicles their painful yet prosperous journey. Let's first start by when you were approached to do the documentary, what was your, you know, what was your initial reaction? <laughs> we were... Uh, Be honest. Yeah, no, no, no. At first, we, we, we didn't know, you know, because we were like, all right, we did the biopic and all that. And our manager was saying how we can really go a lot deeper and, you know, and just really tell more because the biopic only can cover so much. The fact that we get to talk about it and then Tion found all this footage of us, I didn't even know she still had that stuff. What was it like to dive into some of the more difficult things to talk about in this documentary? For me, I kind of hate to go there, but I know it's important, you know, and um, cause you never know how your story can help people. I mean, just the fact that people come up to us and tell us about our songs, you know what I mean? And then we share our personal things that we actually went through and the fact that you overcome those things. See, that's, that's the good thing in it. That's the blessing of it all is, you know, because we're all going to be faced with, you know, hard times and all that. It's like, oh, but can you get through it? Right. Even with us being together, we can have our arguments and all that kind of stuff, but like, we're stuck. It's just us. There can be no replacements or anything like that. I mean, we would never replace Lisa. We, right. we couldn't. You guys pushed through that because mm -hmm. you, 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 you stayed together. Yeah, until unfortunately. I mean, we had to. We had to do it. It's either, you know, crap or get off the pot, you right. know? There's so, that too. Yeah. <laughs> so you were a singing group. Mm-hmm. You know, and 
back in the day, in the 90s, everybody was like, well, it's a rap group, or they tried to label you guys, tried yeah. to put you in a box, tried, looked at the clothes you were wearing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there was one time Lisa was wearing a condom on her on her glasses, oh, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. And was that a conscious decision, or is it just how, what you guys were, who you were at the time? No one said it to us. You know, we talked about it. It was, uh, we kind of looked at it like the condoms were accessories, you know? And so <laughs> normally, you know, people are, a little embarrassed to go and buy a box of condoms, right. but you know, you know, obviously it's something that can save you, right? Before the video came out, radio did not jump on that song just yet because they didn't get it. Don't go chasing waterfalls, okay? Please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. Mm -hmm. What are they talking about? And so when you saw the video, it brought so much life to the words. And that's when people were like, oh, shoot. Right. That's what they're talking about. You know, a waterfall is anything that is destructive in your life. Don't go chase that. Whether it's a relationship, you know, moving, whatever it is, you know, just don't, don't chase that. Is there a song that you did that you love so much that didn't? you know, make it huge and you think it should have? Well, I can speak for Tion too because we both, it's our favorite song. Case of the Fake People. That's when I decide to say goodbye, goodbye to all the fake people in my life. That was on Crazy Sexy Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was your, that's your favorite song that, that you've done? That was one of my favorites and we wanted it to be a single, but it was just, I don't know, it just didn't happen for whatever reason. And uh, I kind of looked at it like it was like a part two of What About Your Friends? You know, because yeah. fake people, I mean, fake people. I don't know. they're everywhere, stab you in the back, Every you know? <laughs> I mean, everywhere. Like, you gotta be careful. Yeah, you do. With every tour being different for various reasons, what are you, what are you hoping for this one? What are you expecting? Um, well, you know, touring is my most favorite thing. Besides being in the studio, I could be, I'm one of those artists that could totally be on the bus, like a bus tour, for like a whole year, you know? Like, I love it. I love to cook on my bus. On the bus. What is it? It's 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 a long time now, but mm -hmm. when you lose anybody, yeah. anybody in your life, mm -hmm. you know, and very few people know what it would be like to lose one of three in a group yeah. that that is world world famous. So very few people know that kind of loss, but we've all lost someone we love. Yeah. And I know from personal experience, you know, even 21 years later, something will hit me in the face like a, like a bag of bricks. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be just like it was that day. Does, does that happen to you? And, and if so, what, what kind of things trigger it? Is it music or is it just a thought that comes past you? I'm gonna be honest with you. It, it could be the, it could be the most random thing. Anything. It really can. And it's just like, wow, you know? Now I will say, every time, and I mean every single solitary time I watch our sleigh ride video, the Christmas one, mm -hmm. and at the very end, when we say, ha, 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 you know, and the three of us are hugging. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Ha, ha, ha. And it's like a still shot. And I don't know what that is, but every time I see it, I'm just like. That like, does something. Yeah, I, it, I don't know, I get choked up. Watching you guys hug on stage did that too. That does it too. In but, the documentary. But the, video, but the video, and I've seen that a few times, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, it's more like that, but I don't know. It's, it's something about that, that particular picture at the end of the video, it just gets me. It, you already have a legacy. Like, TLC has a, an incredible legacy. You are like a living legend, uh. right? You're one part of a, <laughs> three people in a group that's one of the biggest groups of all time. That's, that's just fact, and you've got so much more to do. You say that in the documentary, too. What, what do you see for TLC, you know, moving forward? So we are currently working on our musical. That's in the works, so that, that's definitely going to happen. So excited about that. Broadway. Yes. There's a lot of music there. I know. Right? Yeah, and we even talked about, you know, creating some new music for it, just however it comes together. But it's gonna be great, trust me, it's not, you're not gonna hear about it <laughs> unless it's gonna be unless great. Unless it's gonna be great, right? Yes. Anything that your music 
touches, whether it's new fans, <laughs> fans. I mean, seriously, this is what I said to you. It's it's timeless music. Thank you. Your music. I, I have been listening to a lot of it since I knew I was going to be talking to you, and I'm, you could be on the radio today. <laughs> that that's that's a big deal. That's that's why you're one of the biggest it's groups of all time. It's a blessing. Our thanks to Phil for that. The documentary TLC Forever is available to watch June 3rd, 8, 7 p.m. Central Time on Lifetime. And still to come, a highway cowboy ropes in some livestock on the loose. That story when we come back. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. File this away in the do not try this if you come face to face with wildlife. The National Park Service is warning all tourists after this woman was spotted approaching a bison at Yellowstone National Park to get a selfie. The person who recorded the video said that they were in a parking lot when they saw the woman walk toward the bison, which often makes animals feel threatened. The National Park Service, or NPS, has warned that bison are unpredictable and they recommend staying at least 25 yards away from the animal. And finally tonight, livestock on the loose brought to safety thanks to a highway cowboy. Take a look at this. Michigan State Police caught this utterly unbelievable footage of that cowboy galloping down the freeway on a mission to catch this steer named Lester, who'd actually been on the run for six weeks. But it's those kinds of situations the cowboy lives for. He spoke with reporter Brett Cass from our partner station WXYZ about being the star of that now viral video in tonight's local lowdown. It's not Texas, but a pasture just south of Jackson, where you'll find a true Michigan cowboy named Ricky Littlejohn, one of just a few in the entire state. So how long have you been in this business? Oh, I think I wrote my first cow when I was 15. Little John and his fiance Trina Resendez are professional cow catchers, not only roping cows at rodeos, but catching loose cows in real life. Absolutely. We do this almost every day. But not usually on a highway. Not on the highway. <laughs> but that's where their most recent job took them. A steer missing for six weeks was found just north of Holly, wandering near I-75. They called me and were like, hey, is there any way you can come up here and help? And I was a little nervous about going because it's super dangerous to be on the highway. I put another rope on it and kind of worked as a team after that. I've never been, you know, like, I've never seen anything like this happen before, and it was just really cool to be a part of. The entire chase caught on dash cam by a Michigan State Police trooper. The video, now a viral hit. The local cowboy, now a local hero, is enjoying the ride, just happy he could help out and that no one was seriously hurt. <laughs> Yeehaw, and that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here with you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers.